Good afternoon. Happy holidays, everybody. The little chill in the air, a little cloudiness outside. Let's just know that lights are going to sparkle soon, and uh, it's going to be good. So I'm glad to see everybody today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Gail Carr Williams, and I am Associate Director of Community, Neighborhood, and Government Relations at Vanderbilt University. And at Vanderbilt University, we are so excited about this wonderful partnership we have with the Frist Center for the Visual Arts. It's been great. I think we are in our fourth year of this three-part program. So it's been exciting, enjoyable, engaging, and I hope all of you uh, are enjoying it and you feel uh, the joy that we feel by having this program here. So grateful to have you all here on behalf of Vanderbilt University. Wish all of you an amazing, happy, warm holiday season. And with that, I love to introduce my friend and Nashville's absolutely best, probably the country's best, if I could just be so bold, right? <laughs> Executive Director of the Frist Center for Visual Arts, Dr. Susan Edwards. Uh, she's phenomenal. She does phenomenal work, and the Frist Center does phenomenal work to bring to Nashville the best visual arts anywhere, actually, I think. Universe. Universe? Yeah. <laughs> I think we can go universe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ladies why and gentlemen, I said, why no, no, no. there's no limits at the frisk. There you go. No limits. Thank Susan. you, Gail. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to echo uh, Gail's warm welcome. I could never do it with such flair, but I do wish you a happy holiday season, and thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and we are honored to work with Vanderbilt and uh, thank especially Gail Carr Williams, wh whose title she just gave you, um, as Associate Director of the Office of Community, Neighborhood, and Government Relations. Gail is also a member of the Board of Trustees here and the Chair of our Education Council, so we thank her for all that she does. Um, also at the Office of Community, Neighborhood, and Government Relations, I would like to thank Chandra Allison and Midori Lockett for all they do to make this program possible throughout the year. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to also thank the Metro Arts Commission, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts for their continued operating support. Um, I would like to take a moment to remind you that thanks to Vanderbilt, uh, you have a free lunch, uh, so it is uh, through their generosity, and you are welcome to um, have food and drink in the auditorium, but um, we hope you could finish it here before you go into the galleries. The guards have asked us especially to uh, take them off the hook of having to remind you that we asked for no food and uh, drinks in the, in the galleries, so please... Um, Finish your meals here if you could, please. Okay, today's panel focuses on the exhibition Nick Cave Feet, which is on view in the upper level galleries through June 24th, 2018. Please take the opportunity to see it today or, or, and come back often um, over the next six months. It's really a treasure and we're very lucky to have it here. We also want to invite you to go into the Ingram Galleries where you can see World War I and American art after today's program, and um, what um, the program is going to focus on Nick uh, Cave's work, I want to introduce curator Katie Delmay here at the Frisk. She was the curator for Nick Cave's exhibition, and uh, she will introduce more fully our uh, panelists today. They are Richard Ann Pitt and Stephanie Pruitt. And I think Megan Rust is going to be on that panel too. So um, thank you very much, and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Gail, and thank you, Susan. My name is Megan Rust, and I am the Educator for Public Programs here at the Frist Center, and I'm pleased to introduce our panelists today. Um, Stephanie Pruitt is a poet and social practice artist. Richard N. Pitt is a professor, associate professor of sociology at Vanderbilt University, and as Susan said, Katie Delmay is our curator of Nick Cave Feet, the exhibition that we'll be discussing today, and we're hoping to focus on how community or how contemporary artists can offer powerful and transformative community opportunities for communities. So Katie, do you mind starting our conversation today by talking about the exhibition and Nick Cave's practice? 
Sure, happy to. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so our current upper level um, exhibition features the work of the noted Chicago-based artist Nick Cave, whose practice really straddles the visual and performing arts as he works in a variety of mediums, sculpture, video, installation, graphic art even, uh, in addition to movement and sound. He is most well known for wearable uh, human-shaped sculptures that he calls sound suits that we'll see examples of in just a minute. So as you know, our exhibition is entitled Feet, which um, is a reference to accomplishment, of course. Uh, it takes a, a lot of effort to put on a major project like that, like this. But it's also um, a nod to Nashville being Music City. You all may know that often bands are, are listed uh, this way. It would say, for example, Bonnaroo 2017, feet period, and then it will list U2, Lord, Red Hot Chili Peppers, et, et cetera. Um, in this way, uh, Nick Cave very much wants all visitors to have a, a, a really personal experience and relationship with um, his art when they see it. And the open-endedness of this feet title is meant to suggest um, featuring you and me and, and all visitors who come in and see the show, featuring our backgrounds, our narrative, our aspirations, and our dreams. Nick Cave also hopes that um, everyone will see a, a little part of themselves in his artwork. And that starts right here at the um, title wall of our exhibition, where the letters of feet are, in, um, are made out of a mirror, as, as you can see. So on one level, Nick Cave's work can be appreciated and enjoyed by um, people of all, all ages and on a deeper level, they really do address important social issues, um, issues to Rodney King beating in 1991, uh, even more specifically when the, uh, the policemen were acquitted um, in 1992. And as a fellow black man, Nick Cave um, felt very vulnerable at the, at the time. So he made this um, suit of armor, if you will, that protected him from profiling by concealing his race and his gender. Now another really important theme for Nick Cave is um, he's concerned that there um, is a lack of both time and space in contemporary society to really foster our individual dreams and aspirations. So he hopes to provide a, a place where we can temporarily kind of leave the complicated mess of our everyday life and just be transported to a a really fantastic environment where our imagination and creativity can soar. Um, with this round piece, as well as the button walls that surround the runway of sound suits in the first gallery, um, he's evoking a, a starry night sky. And for him, it reminds him of um, very happy memories of lying in um, fields in rural Missouri with his six brothers and, and looking up at the sky, looking for constellations and shooting stars. This very immersive and personal experience with the, with the work continues with this video piece. It's a large-scale projection of a, um, a single figure wearing a sound suit made out of um, black raffia. And the form continually evolves and, and morphs in front of your, your eyes. And it's, even though it's 42 minutes long, I can attest to the fact that it's really hard to take your eyes off of this, this form. Um, the sound also of the raffia kind of swooshing through through the air. It sounds to me almost like the the waves crash, crashing onto the beach, and it has almost a, a meditative quality to it. And that personal and interactive experience continues into the next gallery where we encounter um, literally thousands of um, pieces of bamboo that have been strung together and hang from the ceiling. They are, um, they've been hand printed with a very, with, again, very bold colors and different patterns. And as we walk around the, the 
He's, Nick sees this as being an enchanted forest, and as we walk around it, again, our perception of it shifts, and uh, we have a very uh, uh, a unique ex interaction with the, um, with the object, with the installation. And finally, as you may have noticed, most of Nick Cave's work is made from objects that, uh, once discarded objects, that he has sourced from antique malls and thrift stores. And he sees his taking of these objects and turning them into fine art as a way of, of, of rescuing these no longer wanted by some pieces. And um, by doing that, he really bestows value not only on these, these objects but on the associated people and, and memories and um, that's really an underlying part of um, Nick Cave's practice is um, offering a spotlight and giving value to people who may um, not always receive it. So um, and here's a detail of that wall installation. So our exhibition is just one half of our Nick Cave project. Um, it is very important to Nick Cave that he, uh, his art and his, his messages, if you will, really extend beyond the gallery and art museum walls. He wants to really connect in a meaningful way with the community and to bring different elements of a city together. So he stages very, um, elaborate public art performances using members from the co community, various talented people, and, and bringing them together after months and months and months of, of preparation. Um, this, um, these performances are a little hard to, to describe. Here's a photo of one um, from, uh, from Detroit uh, a year or two ago. Um, but I also have a short video that I think you'll hear um, is a really good way to understand more about these performances. You hear Nick talk about his motivations himself. So if the technology gods are with us, hopefully it'll play in a moment. I don't know if you all have met Nick yet. Uh, this is Nick Cave. It's nice to be back. And, and to be with everyone, uh, you know, the project is kicking off. I've always known deep down inside that I was special, let's say. Mm -hmm. But I never really sort of uh, took the liberty to sort of embrace it until maybe 15 years ago. And then something, I woke up one morning and something said, now or never. And so I had to make a choice. And I, this is what I chose. But it was that sort of moment that sort of defined my life. I mean, literally, my life changed overnight. And so, you know, I'm an artist with the civic responsibility at the end of the day. It's like I get the museums, I get the, the gallery shows, all of that. I, but it's really when I'm working in this sort of capacity that really matters at the end of the day. I think it's, you know, how do we sort of what matters in our, in our lives as we sort of, uh, sort of develop and, and move ourselves forward. And I think that uh, I'm grateful to be able to sort of understand what my purpose is. And, and this project becomes another one of those. Let me show you how I did it fast. I'll show you. And so you put them in your hand and you go like that. You see? See how? And then you just go like that and they just go right on the thing. So a lot of the residents that have participated in the beading project, they come to us, they've come to us stressed. They've come to us with different issues. And this project has really meant a lot to them. It, they have problems that you could not even imagine, but the beating actually helps take their mind off of what's going on with them. It gives them an outlet. Instead of fighting and fussing or crying or screaming, they're putting all that into their artwork. This looks great. This looks fabulous. Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, it's been an experience that I would never inspiring. forget. Yeah, it's been very inspiring as well to see the movement of the clothes and stuff on, and what, and how much passion Nick put in the pieces. So this has been one of my greatest experiences. I'm gonna say as far as production wise, I love this. I love it a lot. It's been a great experience. At first, you know, of course, looking from the outside, you know, outside looking in is kind of like you're trying to understand it, but when you're actually involved in it, uh, I don't know. It's a lifetime. It's an experience for a lifetime. For when I looked at the um, program and I seen, I mean, you flipping pages and pages of artists, that alone inspired me because it's already hard. Me being from Shreveport and traveling a lot, it's hard for this city to come together for anything, um, especially something this big. And to see that it's like a no race barrier to see uh, black, white, Filipino, uh, every race you can think of, see them all involved and everybody got an equal passion for this art, man, it'll do something to you. It'll make you emotional because the city needs this. Yeah. Shreveport needs this, so. Was it been like the fun? Kayla, come on! Yes. It is inspiring, isn't it? And I'm very pleased to, um, to say, if you don't know, that the Frist Center will be producing with Nick Cave a major public performance like this in Nashville in April. And we will be featuring a cross-section of, of our creative community, dozens of dancers, both professional and students, musicians of a wide um, cross of many genres, vocalists, poets, spoken word artists, and we'll also be engaging 12 social services, social services agencies like what was done in Shreveport who will be making um, beaded blankets like what we saw in the video and then representative from those um, agencies will be a part of the performance as well. So for, for Nick Cave, this is a really important opportunity to once again bring different elements of the community together and to offer a platform and visibility to those who may not have it very often. And also, um, he wants to give all of the participants a sense of their, their worth and their potential. So um, that's a little, uh, a little bit about our Nick Cave project, but we also have a, an artist who has um, some, some similar ideology in her own work. So Stephanie, would you like to talk more about your practice? So um, a good bit of what I'll be sharing is language that I really only use when I'm writing a bio or maybe preparing a grant proposal. When it comes to my actual creative practice, most often I start with a question or a curiosity and then I figure out the best vehicle through which to explore that. Um, actually, may I use that later? Thank you. So, uh, I, again, I say poeting regardless of, for, and with the public, because a lot of what I'm talking about is kind of the relationship of the artwork to the audience and how, how that might play out in terms of the experience. But again, it all starts from a place of, of curiosity, passion, and often commitment to what I believe art can do for individuals and for communities. Um, so three general categories that, that you might hear some artists use would be a studio practice, a social practice, or a civic practice. And really those lines blur. We often you know, move in and out of them. I think they inform one another. I don't know of any social practice or civic practice artist who has not truly honed their craft in their studio practice first. So you see a lot of movement around them. Um, but a lot of it is about who starts the project. Is it artist-led? Is it their individual vi vision? Or is it in collaboration with a community partner? Um, is, it, is, is the work 
focused on having a specific impact on a certain group of people? Or is it tied to a certain place? Or is the process of creation maybe more important than the end result? So these are some of the, some of the ways that some artists might talk about their practice. Um, and I'll, I'll just give you some examples of projects, Nashville-related projects that I've done and how they kind of move across these categories. But one thing that I really um, love and connect to with Nick Cave's work is that a good deal of it requires audience activation. His work is fully realized, fully realized in the studio or the initial place of creation. But I feel like the creation cycle takes another level when it has been embodied, either a physical body inside of a sound suit or, excuse me, other ways. So I'll talk about a few of my practices. First, my studio practice often happens at my writing table or maybe in my car. Um, it's internally motivated. It, it can possibly produce a book, but, you know, that's, it can vary wildly depending on where my mind is. Another way my studio practice presents itself is by publishing physical poems, either in shadow boxes or I call the little sculptures um, failed poem, uh, self-portraits. I shred poems that I've been working on for years and years and years that I decide just aren't working and I stuff the, the heads with all the shredded poems and that allows me to move on and <laughs> let go of it. Um, an example of civic practice where I'm collaborating with a community partner and they have a very clear um, purpose or intent would be a poem that is etched currently in the, the ground at the Nashville, Nashville Sound Stadium. Um, the organizers at the stadium wanted to really focus on a certain walkway and move the crowd through that walkway. And using text, I was able to, instead of signs and arrows, the text moves people through the space. I enjoy being commissioned to really research the history of that place and write a place-specific poem. Another example of civic practice would be um, an exhibit I have at, or an installation at the downtown library in relation to a series of civil rights uh, workshops that the library was, was putting on. After two years, they had thousands and thousands of post-it notes with feedback or questions or phrases from these workshops. And over the course of a week, I went through every post-it note, circled words or phrases, and then quilted them together into one cohesive poem. And throughout the process, I was using the windows to kind of stitch them together and, and write notes. Another example of civic practice uh, would be working with community groups. Um, one, the, the gold face was actually on exhibit here at the Frist Center, I believe two years ago. And then the house was a work that um, was done recently at the Napier Sudicum housing projects through MDHA. In both cases, I collaborated with community partners that wanted to use art as a vehicle of communication or relationship building or to explore certain topics. And so all of these were inspired by poems and then you know, manifested physically. Um, kind of moving into social practice, I publish poems in vending machines, little poetry bubbles. So it starts with my studio practice, writing the poems that, you know, I, I'm just inspired by myself. But when I think about the next stage of their life and how they'll live in the world, I'm interested in people finding poems in unexpected places and ways. And, and the thought of how do you experience a poem in a textbook versus a vending machine that you walk by at a coffee shop. Um, another example of social practice would be a project a few years ago during the 30 Americans exhibit here at the Frist Center. How many of you experienced the 30 Americans exhibit? I love it. I recognize some people who I saw one of the many days that I came. But for 30 days, every day, I came to the exhibit, selected a different work by a different artist, and sat in the gallery and wrote a poem in response to it. In a way, it was like public performance art in that all of the, the gallery visitors were walking around me and sometimes wondering who is this miscellaneous woman with purple hair, you know, <laughs> writing in the floor at the Frist Center. And so it was an exploration of poetry as public art, but also kind of pulling the veil back from, from the process of, of writing. A couple more examples. Um, at Oz Arts Nashville, I created a poemscape, collaborated with about 30 artists to create a poemscape, a single poem that I wrote. I distributed to about 30 collaborators, um, visual artists, musicians, a chef, an aromatherapist, an architect, um, to interpret that poem in some sort of physical way that people could walk through, smell, touch, taste. And again, none of, nothing in that poem could have existed without the interaction of the audience and without the collaborators breathing their life into it. So it had to be activated. Um, 
And one final example, uh, my husband and I have, have curated and hosted an event called Poems and Pancakes out of our home for the last eight years. And it's all built on the idea of how do you connect a seemingly disparate group of people? So our neighbors, church members, people we work with, miscellaneous people we meet at the gas station, we invite them all into our home, make about a mountain of three or 400 pancakes, and we bring in a poet. So under the guise of listening to poetry and eating pancakes, people are coming together with groups they might not otherwise meet and, and know, and they're finding common interests, and it's all activated by this artistic experience. And kind of the completion of it, well, one stage of the completion of it for us is you see the gentleman writing on a window. So after they've experienced poetry, we want people to create something, draw something on the window, write something. So again, the art inspires this connection and activity. But all of these are based on, I guess, my general interest in relationships and connecting dots. And you know, while these, just to bring this kind of back up again, while these categories can feel like something you need to study and memorize in a chart, the reality is I think most artists have personal um, interests and focal points and curiosities and desires and maybe obsessions. And it's about finding the vehicle through which you can truly explore and maybe impact the wider world in those areas. And so these are three of those categories. But I would say arts education, arts advocacy, these are also avenues. And quite often, I'm just kind of jumping on lily pads to explore them all. Thank you, Stephanie. So Richard, your research as a sociologist is primarily on how people derive social identities and those you describe as category polluters. So can you tell us what that is, what a category polluter is, and can this apply to artists like Stephanie or Nick Cave whose works don't really fit inside a single box? Thank you. Um, so to give you a frame for what I'm going to say, um, I'm going to take you back historically a little bit to when I was in grad school getting a PhD in sociology, a discipline that most people think is probably one of the most liberal of the social science disciplines. And I was a black pro-life evangelical Republican getting a PhD in sociology. And I, I wrote a musical like the whole time I was in grad school. So, uh, and that musical called Closets had uh, these words as one of the, the important songs in the play. So it, it read this way, people are strong on the outside. There's nothing wrong, so it seems. But when they go home, it's there to haunt them time and time again. Because in their closets, the skeletons still have flesh on their bones. And their secrets, nobody knows. The she in her closet, the he in his closet, the me in my closet, Nobody knows. And so as I wrote this musical, which at its heart was about people who are religious uh, living in closets, what I was keeping as a secret uh, was that I was a gay, black, pro-life, evangelical Republican. Um, and this play was, was a coming out uh, in my head, but nobody saw it as that because of what I consider category pollution. Right, and so there's this interesting thing around category pollution that is where we have conventional ideas of what something should look like, and if you don't look like that thing, uh, your category pollution can either render you implausible, that is people saying, uh, you can't be a Christian if you're gay, or uh, invisible, where uh, he can't possibly be gay, he's such a good Christian. And so at the intersection of those things that we don't think should go well together because of our conventional understandings of these categories, people live. And so when I'm thinking about uh, the work that Nick Cave does, the work that Stephanie does, um, I think we have these conventional ideas of what an artist is, right? And, and especially so much of Nick's work is what we think contemporary art is. It's whimsical and it's fantastical and, and everybody can find their story in it because there are doilies there and I, I recognize that and there's Donald Duck and that takes me back to my childhood. 
But as you saw what, uh, saw Nick's description of his own work, he talks about uh, this, this awakening in terms of identity where he moved from just being an artist to someone who sees themselves as responsible in terms of their art, right, as a social activist. And I think when we think about social activists, we have a different picture that is not whimsy, it is not fantastical, it's not I look at your, your, your uh, protest signs and listen to your speeches and can find whatever I want to find in that presentation of art. It's pointed and meant to affect change, either to impede some change or to promote some change in terms of the production of this activism. And so I think, I think Nick Cave sits at this interesting space, and so does his art, in terms of figuring out, is this guy just an artist, and I can go and watch his performances, or I can go upstairs and watch the static art and enjoy it, um, or is it something that I should leave changed? Right? I don't come into the gallery and leave the same way I did, just with more joy. And some of that is this question around who gets to decide what identity is operative. Right? So he's, he's, his thing is in an art museum. And if you Google Nick Cave, you don't get a picture of a black guy first. You get a picture of a white Australian guy first, <laughs> a singer. And if you saw this art installation and didn't know that he was a black man, would you experience it the same way? Or does framing it as the work of a black man in America change uh, the identity that he has, change your response to it, right? And so I, I, I know that, that, you know, to some degree in his history as an artist, he has really been interested in letting people find their own experience, their own story when they walk into galleries and watch his art. But it's been very clear to me that the sound suits did not come out of, oh, I just want to put some fabrics together. Right? It came out of very explicitly an experience as a black man, that's an identity um, that lives in America that has a particular kind of framing, that has a particular kind of history, um, and that shows up in his work. And so the question is, is he fully satisfied if people come into, this, into the gallery and look at the sound suits and walk out with smiles on their faces and recollections of their heritage, as opposed to what many African Americans do when they encounter his art. They walk out with emotions. They walk with different emotions, right? They experience him as a black man who has presented something specific with a story to be told that resonates with our experience as black people. And I walk out of that, uh, that uh, gallery not smiling and not joyous, but pensive and, and distressed and maybe even angry. And so when I think about Nick Cave's work and that category pollution of, yes, I want to enjoy this as art, but my interaction with this art as a black man, my interaction with him as a producer of art as a black man, is that all changed by my knowledge and the way that I produce, that I interact with that work that actually changes the nature of his work for me in a way that I'm not always convinced it changes the nature of the work for other people. I think people walk into that gallery and are like, this is just beautiful and it connects to me. Um, but then for me, it's like if I'm walking next to you and you're watching the, the artwork of um, the, the hand, and I could just describe it as just the hand, right? The hand. Um, that has all these linens around it, right? If I see you say, oh, well, that's just clever and interesting, and what I see is the black man inside of a very elite uh, restaurant bathroom that I and my parents couldn't go to, uh, couldn't be in, except as the person giving those linen cloths to other white parishioner, white people uh, who take advantage of the restaurant, I don't want you to see it as, oh, this is just really interesting combination of, of dark and light, of, 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 uh, of the, the material that the, the hand is made out of and the linen cloths. I don't want to stand next to you and hear that conversation when I'm in pain experiencing the social activist work and you're standing next to me experiencing the artist's 
work, right? And so he sits at this sort of intersection of these two, and that intersection is shaped by framing, right? By the placards on the walls, right? By his picture in the uh, brochure that gives it a different meaning that is not going to magically happen or not going to naturally happen without that kind of framing. And as we'll talk in a moment around the way art museums are different from the performance spaces that we'll encounter in the <coughs> spring around his art, museums aren't often spaces where I can turn to the people smiling through, through the art and say, what, what are you smiling about? This, 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 isn't, a ha this isn't happy art. Um, right, I can't do that. And so some of this, and we'll talk about this uh, shortly, is thinking about who owns the art? How does my framing interact with his framing in ways that are different than the way your framing interacts with it? And who gets to do that framing? Is it, is it the artist? Is it the people watching the art? Is it the gallery, et cetera, in terms of determining what this art is supposed to be? So, con so to continue on that conversation, um, we've talked about how artists like Nick Cave and Stephanie are defying these traditional ideas of what the artist is. So do we think that the artist's practice, should, should it expand outside the studio or the museum to relay these messages or social, of social justice? Maybe Katie, as a curator of the exhibition, you can start us off. Sure. Um, I, would, um, I would say there's place for, I would like to see artists presenting their work both in a museum setting as well as outside of a museum setting. Obviously, you're going to have the most um, targeted impact or um, your impact could be greatest on a particular community if you go to a place that let's say is traditionally underserved with cultural experiences and that is something that's important to Nick. Um, a, a community that may not um, be interested in going to an art museum, they may not think they're interested in art, especially contemporary art or um, you know maybe they may lack resources or transportation to, to come to a museum. So I certainly think that that's an incredibly valuable part of um, an artist with a social-based practice is really getting outside of those traditional art venues. But I do think an art museum, you know, call me bias, still has a very <laughs> important role as, as well. And um, here at the Frist Center, our um, annual attendance is roughly 200,000 people, and with our Nick Cave show being up for seven months, I mean, that has the potential for, you know, 100,000 people at least to be able to see this exhibition. So um, I think that, um, and I don't know, Stephanie, what you think about, like, the traditional venue for arts versus, you know, some of these um, non-traditional ones, but I think really doing both is possibly the most effective. And in our situation, I would say the um, having the exhibition almost as an anchor to the performance is a really helpful. So again, we will be utilizing, I think at the end of the day, hundreds of people within our community as part of uh, the performance and with their families and their friends. I think that not only being participants in the performance and understanding that part of Nick's practice, but also then being able to come to the museum and get a, a fuller picture of it as well is very helpful. I mean, I'll have to start out by saying, I might be museuming wrong. Is that even a word, museuming? I mean, you know, I, I went through this exhibit and some of my initial reactions, I wanted to run through architectural forest and hear the sound. I wanted to lick some of the works on the wall. I'm sorry, I didn't do it, I promise, Susan. But I mean, I just had these impulses and feelings and reactions and that was the beauty of it for me. When I read placards on the wall, I had another experience. But I think one challenge or one, one opportunity for artists is to think about your relationship to the work and if and when you make the conscious decision to publish it or exhibit it, recognizing that you are handing it over into the public realm for people to have their experience of it. And I am very interested in the things that Dr. Pitt said about, you know, is it okay if the person next to me is happy and joyful when I'm angry and hurting? Because I think that potential conversation is where a good part of the art actually lies. I would privilege 
any interpretation and experience you're having. Feel what you're feeling, notice what you're notice. But the true power and possibility in my mind comes when we actually do connect with another museum visitor or you know, a conversation and say, well, I felt this way about it. Oh, well, I saw this, I felt that way. And that to me is really interesting. I mean, there are times when I will look at a, at a work and I am angry and upset. There are times that I look at the same work and I'm joyful and I actually get a sense of freedom from it. Mm -hmm. And I think the power is in moving between those spaces and realizing that it's not a single thing, even if for the artist, and I say this as a poet who has been deeply misunderstood by many readers, <laughs> That's the beauty of art. I'm not saying anything goes. I'm not saying any and every interpretation is right. I would move away from right, the idea of right and wrong interpretations. And as a social practice artist, I privilege experience. Experience it and realize and notice what you are experiencing and be willing to start from there possibly with the conversation. But I'm sorry, the actual question was about the importance of museums versus like community <laughs> social practice. For me, the equivalent would be publishing maybe in a literary journal and or you know, having a work in a museum. What's powerful there is that there are resources. There is historical knowledge where your work can be contextualized and put together and thought of in kind of a larger historical narrative. Whereas often with social practice or publishing in in physical social spaces, it's that immediate experience that might not connect to a larger picture of your work. So I think both are very important, and, and I get different things from, from each experience. Amen. Um, uh, but one of the other things that I think about with museums is, in some ways, the static nature of the presentation. So. These are called sound suits, not pretty pieces of fabric. They're called sound suits for a reason, right? He wanted to say, here's a suit that covers me in terms of armor, but then he also reflects on it as the sound that it makes makes me no longer invisible, right? And so if the, if the sound suits are all sitting on a stage, on a sort of static runway, can we experience the art in the full way that he f creates and frames the art? Right? If he frames it as not just a thing that protects me, but a thing that empowers me, do I get the empowerment piece if it's not moving and not making any sound? Right? Uh, I've read my, my song to you. If I read my song in different ways, you would experience it differently because of my performance. The dogs that you see upstairs. Uh, he, he thinks of the dogs as this beautiful uh, animal here in the front, but he also talks as the dog like, that's my dog on the third row, uh, D-A-W-G, my homeboy, my loyal person. It's different in terms of thinking about loyalty by framing it as a D-O-G dog, right? And so some of that comes in performance and interaction with the artist and with the art and I often wonder if that can happen if the art is static and on a wall and we can't touch it and we can't experience it and it's not moving if that's an important part of the art, et cetera. I love my favorite piece, obviously, uh, given what I'm saying to you now, is the taffeta video, right? Because then you get to see the, the invisibility piece of it. Uh, the, the invisibility piece of it and then certainly you can hear the rustling in the video as it's moving and I can experience everything he's trying to tell me in the art and then make up my mind as opposed to only having half of the story he's trying to present in the art because it's sitting there static and not moving. Well, I would just like to get back to the question about the um, interpretation and I do think that it is important to Nick to have um, you know, as I said earlier in my overview, he really does want people to interpret it with their own background, knowing that that's going to be very different. But he also wants, and he sees his art as being a point of connectivity and compassion, and that even, you know, maybe this is a way that I, as, you know, a white woman, might understand what it is like to have been to be profiled as a black man. And so I think that it's those types of opportunities that he hopes to offer through the exhibition. And he does also talk about how um, 
one of his greatest um, pleasures, really, is when he sees two totally different people looking at one of his art objects and talking about it and finding both commonalities. You know, my grandmother had a red, you know, ceramic sculpture of a, of, of a cardinal. Oh, and so did mine's. But then also, you know, in an ideal world, also, um, seeing where there are different backgrounds and experiences and coming, you know, maybe understanding more about that um, as well. And I would also just say that as a curator, um, Nick doesn't like a lot of written interpretation in the galleries. For those of you who come to a lot of our shows, you'll see that there are fewer words on the walls than what we normally present. And um, for him, I think, I feel like we, we got the basics out there. We do at least talk about the genesis for the sound suits, because I think that is a critical piece of information for, for people to, to know about as they're going through the exhibition. But it's not, I don't think it's curatorially very heavy-handed. Um, and following in that spirit, what we did in both our audio tour and the publication, if you will, that accompanies the exhibition, is we um, invited other people, again, members of our creative class, a cross-section, actually, of them, not me, to respond to the work. So Stephanie, as a poet, um, she, um, in the audio tour, she um, actually wrote some poems that were um, responses to the work. We had a musician, a dancer, another visual artist, and a, a recent grad from TSU. And so, I spoke a little bit in the audio tour, but in that way, I think that he, Nick, feels like it's important to get a broad array of perspectives and interpretations, and that then as you are going through the exhibition hearing those, then you'll be informed, you uh, will have a broader um, interpretation as well. So Nick and Stephanie aren't the only ones that are um, working in the community to connect different um, different groups and bringing visibility. Um, I thought we could close our conversation with talking about a few different um, artists here in Nashville that are working similarly to Nick and um, Stephanie. So, so um, uh, and one question that we haven't really ad addressed yet, but uh, or w one question that we talked about in our planning meeting last week that I'd like to just briefly touch on is the idea of who's funding these non-traditional art projects. Um, for a museum, it's a little hard to, to justify um, paying for these projects that are happening well outside of your, your building. And um, for better or for worse, a, a major part of our indicator of success or a mark of success is our attendance. And can we count people who actually don't step into our building? And I just want to, I'm really pleased that the leadership at the Frist Center was, is willing to um, produce this uh, performance in association with our, our exhibition. Um, and I think that uh, more and more museums are um, thinking along these lines and understanding the importance of um, these socially based practices and how we need to foster those as well. But there are other sources and other places to support projects like, like this. Of course, there's the National Endowment for the Arts and the NEH, but closer to home, um, the Metro Arts Commission is doing a lot in this department and they um, they offered a artist training program called the Artist Lab in 2016, I believe, where 25 local artists um, were selected, well, they applied for, and then they were selected to be a part of this training that really taught, um, I think, exposed these artists to more information about civic and socially based practices. Many of the artists, um, you know, they had successful studio practices, but really kind of um, opened their eyes to other opportunities and then helped them kind of think of their, their practices in different ways and how to actually implement that. Um, the Metro Arts Commission, after that training, they also have offered um, several Thrive grants to many of these artists. And um, so there's a lot going on in Nashville, and I would uh, say largely because of what Metro Arts is doing. 
One project is there's a collective called um, NORF, and it is three or four young, uh, in my mind at least, young guys um, who make murals in North Nashville. Um, the the uh, one was that we just saw was looking at the civil rights movement here in Nashville. Uh, the the next one is actually at, at Slim and Huskies, and um, also there's an artist, uh, a learning lab artist who received Thrive money um, named Xavier Payne. He did a billboard campaign also in North Nashville, looking at gentrification and the impact that that's having on. Um, on our city specifically in that neighborhood. And then, um, Megan, the next artist was one that you were more familiar with than I am. Yes, this was um, a project that was done with the Faith and Culture Center and the artist is Sarah Bozen and she um, did a project called Moral Lines where um, she wanted to encourage um, p communities to have conversations with the Islamic and Arabic um, communities in Nashville to connect those um, communities with conversation and the project was she invited people to come and take turns drawing lines and just simply having conversations about you know their different communities to help sort of increase each other's knowledge of each other so and Stephanie is doing another project do you want to speak on that sure and but first I'll also say um, there are, there's a lot of work being done that is not necessarily institutionally supported, but where artists have a vision and a passion, and just no matter what, they're going to make it happen. So I have loved all of the projects we've talked about. I think they, they have probably received a le level of visibility that a lot of local artists don't get for doing very important social practice and community impact-based work. And I mean, there, I, I see artists in, in the audience here, um, Camilla Spadafino, Beth English, Ashley Seagrove, are artists who often volunteer to do this type of work and one thing I am passionate about is making those connections with institutions and artists to see the benefit quite often when I do a project it might come under the PR budget and even the, and although I see it as art the benefit for the institution and what they can put it in under their accounting is public relations and I've gotten to a point now where I can say that's fine. The art is getting done. It's reaching the community. Um, cor some corporations are sponsoring projects um, as a way to kind of build a sense of placemaking and, you know, like the Nashville Sound Stadium. It's a creative way to accomplish a task, but as the artist, it's a way to get the work funded and out into the world. And the Sounds Project I mentioned um, ended up being a major PR feat for them in that they got national uh, recognition from USA Today and being one of the most creative uh, you know, baseball stadiums with the art installation. So there are mutual benefits. Um, but I guess one thing that, I'm sorry, I I'm having eight thoughts and trying to quickly get through them because I know we're at time. So this is, might sound disjointed, but let me just say it before I forget. Something that Professor Pitt said I think was very important to think about, how the artist's intention can sometimes feel like it's being challenged in a public space and what they're hoping and wanting might not get across. And I think that's where bravery and generosity come in from the artist's perspective to actually allow your work to go out and you not be able to control how it's consumed. And that's kind of at the core of social practice art. Process is so much more important than you know, consensus of end result. And the bravery Nick that loves to say the process is the project. Exactly, it is. It truly is. And, and that, that's a challenging position to be in. So I think funders and supporters of, of this work are really at the cutting edge of what contemporary art is doing right now. And, and supporting it is a way of moving so many conversations forward and progressing communities with art at the center of it. That was disjointed, I apologize. Well, we want to leave some time for questions. Uh, Anne will be coming around with a microphone. If anyone has a question, if you just want to raise your hand. Well, I have a question for Dr. Pitt while you all are thinking about it. <laughs> so um, while listening to you um, to you talk, do you, do you have issue then with Nick Cave's interest in not um, having 
a lot of interpretation in the galleries. Do you want a label that says that that piece specifically that we just went by, that that to him is about the position of servitude that he saw his grandparents in when they were working at a fancy restaurant? Like, do you, do you wish that he wanted more of that interpretation so that everyone can um, have that, make that more direct connection? Yeah, again, um, it goes back to my question around once you produce the art and we recognize, the community recognizes you not just as an artist but as an activist with a message that many of us cannot uh, get out in the world, I think there's this question again of whose art is it once you produce it and display it um, and is it, is it still your art or is it the art of our people uh, trying to get across a message that I, no one will listen to me when I say it, but they will listen to you when you say it because you're upstairs in the Frist Museum. Um, and so, again, it's a tension for me around category pollution, is that I recognize that people can't see him as both necessarily, and I would like it, I would like I, in my case around Nick Cave, would like more sort of front staging of the social activism because he, in interviews, front stages it and says my art's not just about bling bling and uh, sparkle sparkle. It's there are guns or there are bullets or there are targets in my art because that's important to the story I, I'm setting out to tell. And so to some degree, if that's the story he says he's trying to tell, I want people to get it. Um, and sometimes um, doing that kind of framing, I think, gets that done. So I'm, I'm, I'm tense around it, but I take my lead from him. He says my art came out of a purpose, uh, has a purpose. And so I want some of that purpose, maybe 10% of it, to be realized, and that has to be framed, because I don't think people get it necessarily if they didn't see the blue um, representing police in some of his art. Some people need to be pointed. See that blue? That blue represents the police in my art. So you're referring specifically to this sound suit, which um, Nick refers to as one of his target sound suits. There are a lot of different types of sound suits. Um, and when you look closely at the, the head, there is a, the target has been created in red and green and black beads, um, symbolic of the African-American flag. And then um, if you look even more closely, I don't have the clicker with me, but some of the wire that is on top of the, the target, there are little patches of blue. So obviously a very direct reference to the, the police um, and the confronting an African-American. Will Nick Cave in April go to another place other than the Frist or the Skirmahorn area? Will he go to some other neighborhood, perhaps near here, that is suffering from gentrification? Do you know? So you're saying, will he specifically? Yes. He has been in a lot of communities. Um, he's been to Nashville three or four times. We've been to TSU. We've been to Fisk. We've been to Slim and Huskies. We've um, uh, been to a variety of places. First, we were sourcing a site, and he did, he's interested in getting to know our community better and more. We have, you know, for time restraints, the Frist staff has been tasked with really um, getting out there and getting to know members of, of our community, presenting them to, to Nick and saying, we recommend working with these different groups. And um, then those people will be brought to, to the Frist Center and then to the symphony, and Nick will work with them directly. But he has been to quite a few different places already and we have ambitious dreams for more um, more field trips if you will or more um, places of in engagement when he's here in in February he'll be here for another visit and then also in April for the um, the residency right before the performance we probably have time for one more question if anyone has anyone well, thank you all for joining us this afternoon.